Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of December 13, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss what we will be focused on in the governor's supplemental FY22 and FY23 budgets to be released this week. Second, we provide our way too early thoughts on the Permanent Fund Board's decision late last week to terminate Executive Director Angela Rodell. And third, we explain why we agree with Dermot Cole's concerns about the Permanent Fund's in-state investment program. And now, let's join Michael. Let's kick things off uh, here first and foremost. Uh, The governor's budget is due, uh, according to law, is due on the 15th of December. Now, sometimes they produce it a little early to give you some time to flap your gums and everything else. But we think this is going to come right down to the wire, I think, is kind of the supposition right now, especially with the new revenues and the things going up and down and oil prices kind of going all over the place. Give us your take on what's happening with the governor's budget, and we will start there this morning? Well, I think the governor is going to take it to uh, the very end to, uh, to see if, uh, see what happens with what's happening with oil prices. Um, In fact, I wouldn't be shocked if he took it to the end of the week. I know that the, the statutory deadline is uh, the 15th, uh, uh, which is Wednesday, but uh, I I wouldn't be surprised if it uh, comes in a little bit later. Uh, Basically what's going on is we had the oil price dip uh, on uh, Black Friday after Thanksgiving, uh, a deep oil price dip uh, as a result of news about the Omicron variant, uh, uh, the SPUR release, the, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve release coordinated between the U.S., India, China, and Japan, um, and uh, OPEC's decision following that uh, to continue to uh, increase uh, additional supplies, and the the price uh, the price dipped. Uh, uh, for uh, for a, a period uh, down to levels that uh, that would not support uh, what the governor was saying in the uh, earlier in the in the fall when prices were up. Since that time, prices have uh, come back up some, uh, not to the levels they were before the the Black Friday dip, uh, but they've come back up some, uh, and they're continuing to rise as concerns about the impact of the Omicron variant to uh, uh, subside. Uh, as uh, as the market has sort of absorbed uh, the consequence, the significance of the spur, uh, the coordinated spur release, um, and as uh, OPEC has uh, stabilized the market, uh, frankly, by announcing that they were going to increase volumes, but they were keeping their meeting open uh, so that they could come back and uh, and cancel that increase or temper that increase uh, if the market didn't respond uh, uh, as they anticipated. So prices have uh, prices have come back up. Uh, they came back up throughout throughout the week, and they and the expectations are they're going to continue to stabilize um, through this week and and through the end of the year. So, uh, what the governor may be doing is is waiting on uh, prices to uh, get at the best level they can, uh, use those prices for FY22, which will be important to the FY22 supplemental, uh, and uh, for FY23, which is the budget he has to. He's required to uh, submit uh, uh, by December 15th um, and uh, and then uh, uh, sort of, you know, use the benefit of those higher prices to uh, to uh, limit whatever other policies uh, 
uh, he needs to bring into play to have the revenue sufficient to uh, uh, to uh, to match uh, match spending in the budget. At the same time that that's going on, uh, you're beginning to see uh, uh, various uh, lobbying forces uh, uh, push for what they want to see in the budget. There was an article in uh, in Friday, I think it was Friday's Juno Empire, that focused on uh, local the municipalities and what they wanted to see in the budget, uh, led by uh, full re- school bond reimbursement, uh, which has been cut the last few years, um, and and talking about other things they want to see. And there's going to be other things in this budget as well. There's uh, still uh, federal money around, and what's what's the governor going to do with the federal money uh, that uh, that will be spent uh, this coming fiscal year? Uh, there's some infrastructure money coming in already, and how's the governor going to direct that? So there's various issues around around how the spending is going to play out. But I think the big reason for the delay, uh, for the deferral so far to the statutory deadline, and as I say, I wouldn't be shocked to see it go a couple of days beyond. The real reason for that is uh, is is to capture whatever the current oil prices are as he as he goes into uh, goes into the budget mode. Now it's interesting that you say that he's going to go. Be- I mean, it, <clears throat> is the governor allowed to just go beyond the statutory deadline as well? Or I thought it was just the <laughs> legislature that was ignoring statute at this point. Uh, I mean, somebody's going to, you know, I, and I don't know how much the legislature could squawk about it because, hey, they've been ignoring stuff all the time. So I don't know how much fuss they could make over it. I remember one year, um, uh, and I can't recall which year it was, but one year uh, he's required to come up with a long term plan. Uh, as part of the budget process. Uh, and it may have been, Donna may remember this, it may have been uh, Dunleavy's first year uh, that they didn't come out with a long-term plan until like March or April or May. It was, it was well, March, maybe March. Uh, it, was, it was so long delayed that I was sitting out there thinking about bringing a lawsuit to try to to try to compel the production of it. So there's, there are, there has been past practice where, uh, uh, administrations haven't uh, fully complied uh, with the budget statute uh, in in various parts. I seem to recall the past uh, past year when uh, when the budget was delayed, also. But you know, who's going to if it's only two days? I mean, there's not going to be enough time to do right. about it. Sure, people, right. people will squawk, but there's not going to be a big deal about it. Any projections? What you think is going to happen here? I mean, uh, I guess there's some speculation that the governor may uh, just build his whole budget based around the 50-50 uh, plan uh, and actually have it laid out that way in the budget, uh, which again means it's the legislature's baby to uh, to slay at this point. What uh, what say you? Well, yeah, the governor's the governor's budget is his proposal, his policies. It's his opportunity to lay the groundwork for what he wants to pursue during during the session. So. Clearly, it'll be built around 50-50 because that remains the that remains the governor's proposal. the The issue with the issue with it there's there's two issues. Uh, one is FY22. We're still in FY22. The governor talked about when oil prices were still high. The governor talked about a supplemental PFD that would bring this year's PFD up to the full uh, POMB 50-50. So the question is whether uh, he still proposes to do that. I, the oil revenues are not going to be high enough. I don't think uh, to be able to pull that off in FY22 just based on oil revenues alone. So there's going to be an issue about whether the governor is going to propose an overdraw from the ERA, uh, overdraw in the sense of draw higher than what uh, the POMB statute uh, allows, uh, an overdraw from the, the ERA to uh, to go into FY22 and fund that uh, supplemental budget. And then there's going to be the question about FY23. Oil prices are in uh, what what analysts call backwardation. That is, the current oil prices are higher than than future oil prices. They they continue to future oil prices ramp down. So the FY22 is going to come. The governor is coming close uh, with uh, with increased oil revenues, oil prices. The governor is coming close in FY22 to uh, to the the levels he wants to uh, support that supplemental PFD. But oil prices are down in FY23, even with the recovery. Uh, that we've seen. And so there's a question about FY23, whether he's going to be able to fund POMB 5050 based upon the oil prices that uh, that, they're, that they're going to have to recognize in FY23. So that also brings into the question whether there's going to be an excess, he's going to propose an excess ERA draw. POMB 5050, I would be, I would be truly shocked if the budget doesn't come out, uh, doesn't propose POMB 5050. But there's a question 
question on the revenues side uh, about how he's going to fund uh, POMB 5050. I guess there's one other issue that goes with that. I mean, the, the other alternative to funding POMB 5050 would be to cut spending. But we're going into an election year. We saw the pushback in 2019, uh, the strong pushback in 2019 when the governor tried to cut spending down to down to fund uh, to the level sufficient to fund the PFD uh, without a, without additional revenues. Um, and I suppose he could propose to cut spending, but that going into an election year, I would I would highly doubt uh, that's what uh, that's what the governor proposes. So I think the issue is going to be on the revenue side. Does he come up with additional revenues? Is he going to have to come up with additional revenues in FY22 to fund that supplemental PFD he's talked about? Does he still propose the supplemental PFD? And then for FY23, what's he going to do about the revenue shortfall in FY23? There was an article uh, in the, um, I think it was the Juno Empire, um, that talked about some of the things that in the proposed government governor's budget. And one of those things was, of course, uh, you know, all the things that we could be doing. Oh, we could be doing all these great things with, uh, you know, the monies and everything else. And one of those things uh, was, of course, Nils Andreessen from the AML talking about how, oh, we need all these monies for the revenue share and the state needs to pony up. And um, and it, 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 it I got to be honest, Brad, it almost sickens me how much we become sycophantic on how we need to get all this government money out to people. Uh, just break that down for us real quick in, in regards to the governor's budget. Well, uh, Nils is a good law, is, is a good representative of his, of his organization. Um uh, uh, the Alaska Municipal League, uh, which is co- which is composed of the uh, cities and the boroughs, I think the boroughs uh, around uh, around Alaska, um, and they don't want to raise their taxes any more than anybody else. Uh, they like free money as well as anybody else, uh, and and they view the state budget as their opportunity to get. Uh, free money and to, or get money from the state and uh, and limit the amount uh, that they have to raise uh, locally from local taxpayers uh, for their services. So they push hard uh, for uh, for funding and they've got you know we we we've, we've had uh, cuts to uh, school bond reimbursement is a is the best example I think of where the cuts have hit uh, the localities the school boards uh, uh, local governments and and we've had situations where. Uh, uh, the state has made cuts from, uh, like the cut from the PFD, they've made cuts from uh, from what statutes say they ought to be giving to the localities. So the localities are pushing back and say, and saying, uh, no, uh, don't do that. Give us money. But they're going further. I mean, with with Nils in, in charge, uh, Nils is a a, a Wally Hickel uh, 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 admirer. Uh, he was uh, before he came to AML. He was head of the Institute of the North. Uh, which was a Hickel uh, uh, organization, um, and Hickel uh, was not the biggest fan of the PFD. He was in his later years, but during his active public life, uh, he was not the biggest fan of the PFD. And he talked about things like a community uh, uh, fund or a community uh, uh, permanent fund dividend or community dividend, I guess is what he called it, uh, that would, instead of giving money to individuals, would give money to local governments and let local governments decide what to do uh, with uh, with that money. In the in the testimony that AML gave in support of House Bill 4003, which we talked about on previous shows, it's uh, the House uh, Ways and Means proposal to redo the POMB draw and divide it uh, between uh, the PFD and then uh, 25% of the PFD and then half of the remainder, half of the 30, uh, half of the remaining 75% each to K K through 12 uh, education and to uh, and to general government during uh, AML's testimony on that uh, bill AML test brought back up the community dividend uh, idea and talked about the need to give money to local governments um, he didn't say it directly but 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 the implication was to give money to local governments in preference to local individuals right right uh, and uh, and sort of bail out the the local governments in a way where they didn't have to uh, have to increase their well, taxes. <clears throat> this is what kills me because again they keep going on and on and and uh, I got an email from a, a listener in Kodiak which I read on the air last week which was talking about well, what do we do if they cut it off all of a sudden our taxes will go up if we don't get the reimbursement if we don't do well exactly if you guys had to pay for some of this stuff locally it would never happen but because we get this free money from the state all of a sudden it's all good and 
saying, oh, we need that. Um, there's a couple parts in here that I wanted to comment on before we move on. Andreessen says, there's a lot of funding that for some communities they may not be aware of or have the capacity to rant, to write grants for, which is something that Andreessen said the state could help with. What the state needs to have communities help them write grants uh, to get this free money. And then he goes on to say later on, he goes, because the Alaska DOT is not allowed to charge overhead for these grants, it becomes a burden to manage them. Oh, we get this free money, but we have to pay somebody to do the grant. So we shouldn't have to do that. So now we should, uh, you know, uh, put all these other rural trans everything. We should be advocating the federal pass throughs to remain, including the administrative costs. That was uh, that wasn't uh, Andreessen. That was Coaster from the uh, from the Kenai Peninsula or from the uh, city and borough of Juno. But I mean, this is the idea. Oh, we need all this free money, and in fact, we need you to pay for for us to write all this free money. We become so dependent on the largesse of the state. It's just astonishing. Again, if if there was no free money for this stuff, we wouldn't be doing it in communities because the local communities would be up in arms because their mill rates would go up two, three, four points, depending on what's going on. Yeah, Governor Dunleavy tried. I mean, back in, in, in 2019, part of the Dunleavy administration's proposals was to push a bunch of costs down to local government. I mean, again, School bond reimbursement was a was a primary example of that, but there were other things where uh, Dunleavy tried to push you know, costs down to local government, and and it was for that very purpose. I mean, the, the the idea was, would you build schools of the of the cost and of the nature that we're building schools in rural Alaska, if or in, even in urban Alaska, if you if those if those governments if those cities had to pay for it uh, had to pay for it themselves. Force the force the cost responsibility down to the local level and force them to you know make those decisions themselves. That was part of the proposals in 2019. They uh, they got they got the same treatment some of his other cost reduction proposals got. Uh, right. Local governments push back and uh, and and they continue to push back. So right. it's um, we're going to see that tension this 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 uh, uh, this uh, uh, session and we're probably going to see it in future sessions. And it's gotten to the point where local government is is essentially saying, we don't care about the PFD as much uh, anymore. We don't care about money going to our constituents. Uh, we want the money to come to us. Because, we want yeah. the money to come to local local government and we'll save right. our constituents by not having to tax them. We know better than you how to spend your money, essentially, is what's going on at every level now. The legislature, the boroughs, the cities, everything else. Well, the legislators have been happy to overspend for years until, of course, they realize that uh, it's going to overspend from their piggy bank. And now they're reticent to do so. And including uh, including amongst some of those voices was Angela Rodell, who was the uh, permanent fund director. And that leads us kind of it's a good segue into number two uh, for today, which was the surprise on Thursday. I mean, I think it was a surprise to a lot of us, maybe not you. But the surprise that Angela Rodell was removed from the Permanent Fund Corporation as the CEO by a vote on Thursday of five to one um, against her uh, against her reten- retention. Um, so your thoughts on that and what's going on there? Well, I, there's a lot of speculation about that, and I don't have any inside information any more than anybody else. So what you're going to hear uh, here is speculation uh, as well. I will say a couple of things uh, before we get into that deeply on Angela. Uh, first of all, the uh, her position in support of POMB uh, and a rules-based approach, uh, it was not hers alone. It is pursuant to board resolution uh, as recently as 2020, a board resolution signed by Craig Richards that said, uh, that said the, the, the PFD board or the permanent fund board uh, rather uh, supports uh, uh, POMB and supports a rules-based approach that that you know puts a limit on how much uh, how much uh, to draw. So her position in that was not her off on her own frolic and detour. It was uh, it was a position that was that was uh, carrying out uh, the board's position. Now the board has been has been has been somewhat am, somewhat. Um, uh, uh, slushy about that. Let me try that word. Slushy about that in, in recently. Uh, in September, at the September board meeting, there was a flare-up uh, around compensation of of, in, of the investment advisors, the people who do uh, who make the investments on behalf of the on behalf of the board. That's a highly competitive industry. 
Uh, it's a highly compensated industry. Uh, and, uh, and, and Angela was I, proposing uh, compensation levels that uh, were at the market uh, for that type, of, uh, that type of work. The board pushed back, if you'll recall, uh, Commissioner Mahoney, who sits on the board, Revenue Commissioner Mahoney, who sits on the board, pushed back and said, you know, should we be increasing salaries uh, for these people at the time or increasing compensation for these people, because it's part bonus, increasing compensation for these people at the time that the PFD is being cut. Uh, and that sent the board off sort of into a into a cycle. And if you go back, if you go back and read um, some of those news articles around the September meeting, uh, you'll see uh, the conflict uh, between uh, 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 Angela Rodell uh, and the board. Uh, in fact, there's a quote in the in the uh, uh, in the ADN article at the time uh, that Angela is saying, "I'm not sure we're all on the same page." Uh, following that board meeting, and then she and then she declined to make any further comment after uh, after that making state making that statement. So you can see the beginnings of that. Um, and that it, it was a conversation that that conversation was around compensation, but it also got in uh, to the PFD. Uh, in subsequent discussions, uh, well, in in that meeting, and then in subsequent discussions, there there have been discussions about excess draws, um, and there was in fact a presentation at the December board meeting about. The consequence of making an excess draw, and and it looked like it's looked like in the September articles and in the in the uh, presentation at the board this past meeting about excess draws, it, it's looked like that uh, Craig Richards and other commissioners have been pushing for an excess draw. Angela likely was pushing back against that. That could be the that could be a source of it. But 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 go back to the go back to the fundamental of what Angela was saying about the draw was consistent with and in fact required by uh, uh, the board resolutions that have been that have been passed up to this point. And it's a little surprising that if that's the issue, if the excess draw is the issue, uh, that the board didn't take that up as as an amended board resolution or a new board resolution uh, uh, in in this meeting, because if they're going to change the position. I mean, they've set they've set POMV draws as their position, as their policy uh, by, by board resolution. If they're going to change that and talk about, start talking about excess draws, then you would think that it, that it behooves them to, uh, to have a, a, a different policy about that uh, and make that clear in the policy. They didn't take it up uh, in December. So maybe that's something that's coming uh, in the next board meeting. Maybe they're going to have a special board, board meeting. I can't I can't predict where they're where they're taking this. If that was the issue with Angela, they're going to have to confront those their board resolutions uh, have opposed that in the past. This whole thing with the board is, uh, I mean, that's an odd, that's a kind of an odd thing that just out of the blue, all of a sudden in a five to one vote. And of course, then all the posturing from the legislature, which I'm sure we'll get into in the next segment, where they talk about how, oh, they don't want to inject politics into it. But the first thing they do is send a letter to the press talking about all the political maneuvering that they're going to do. Uh, I mean, you know, we're going to hold hearings. We're going to do this. We're going to I mean, which, again, I don't know that a board member could do anything more than sit in front of them and say, I'm sorry, I can't comment on that because that's a personnel issue. And according to Alaska statute, I'm not allowed to talk about that. Um, you know, I, I just don't see anything else coming out of that. Yeah, the, the board, the board's in a tough spot because of that. Uh, I mean, the problem, though, though, is if you don't talk about it or if you don't find a way to talk about it, all of the all of the ambiguity is going to be construed against you, right? It's going to be, you know, politically, those who those who are opponents of the administration or those who want to take shots at the administration will assume the worst uh, in um, in in the discussion. I mean, I, I hopefully the the board and or Angela find a way to talk about talk about this issue uh, in a way that's helpful. I, for those who really want to dive into this, go back seriously. Go back and read. Uh, the articles around the September board meeting and the dispute that occurred at the September board meeting. You can see now that you know the end result. Now that you, now that you know the board dismisses Andrew, uh, Angela in in December, you can start seeing that uh, in the in the in the articles and in the comments made uh, around uh, around the September board meeting. And Angela's comment at the end of that at the end of the September board meeting that. I went back and found it. It's not clear to me anymore that we are all on the same page, uh, she told trustees. I mean, that's 
if you have a, a CEO telling the board that uh, in the in the middle of a board public board meeting, uh, you know there are issues going on. That that just doesn't that's, that's something that you just don't see in a board meeting unless there are, there are truly issues going on. They could be there could be personality issues. Uh, there could be, I mean, from time to time, I've heard people talk about the administrative costs of the of the permanent fund and and that they're they're high uh, compared to other funds. They may be. Uh, there's a way you could look at them that they would be, and that could have add, added to the strain. This sounds a lot more like internal personality uh, conflicts. Craig Richards is a strong, sometimes difficult personality. Uh, Angela is a strong personality. You can see. Uh, I could see conflicts going on in that. You could sort of see the strain in the December board meeting when they were having the presentation on the impact of excess draws. Um, so it could be a combination of things, but it'd be useful if they find a way to talk about it. Otherwise, uh, Bert and, and Click and, and other politicians are just going to, you know, have a heyday making up their own stories about uh, about why the board uh, did what they did. And, and it'll all be nefarious because they'll all want to tie it back to some failing on the part of the governor. Well, and that's exactly it. I mean, this becomes the stalking horse, right? I mean, the uh, they, they can't say anything. The board can't say really say anything due to personnel issues and laws. If it was on the other foot, the legislature would be screaming that we can't talk about it because of the law. But at the same time, they'll be more than happy to use it and beat somebody to death with innuendo and everything else. And that's kind of what hap- That's kind of what I foresee happening here in the near future on this. That they're going to use it for, you know, public sham try. You know, kind of the the pub the court of public opinion. They're going to put these public sham hearings on and everything else, and be able to grandstand and and beat their chests about it. It 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 the board's going to have to do something if if Dunleavy proposes an excess draw. Um, uh, as part of as part of the budget, uh, that is inconsistent with board resolutions to date, um, and the board's going to need to say something about that. Maybe uh, this is you know we saw the first shoe in September, we saw the second shoe here. Maybe there's a third shoe coming in terms of a revised board resolution that talks about excess draws and and expresses support for excess draws within certain confines. Maybe maybe that's where we're headed here, and maybe. That what we what we what happened behind closed doors was a shootout about whether Angela would be on board with that board resolution once it was proposed about excess draws. So maybe maybe there's a third shoe to come, and it'll all become clear when that third shoe drops. If that third shoe is an excess draw, there's going to be something needed from the board, or else the next executive director is going to be in exactly the same position, constrained by board positions to say, right, right. Our, our position is POMV, rules-based, no excess draws. Your final thoughts there before we move into number three. I, I, I think we need to, I mean, people are going to jump to conclusions. We're going to have these legislative hearings. People are going to you know, want to come up with their own theories about why, uh, why uh, Angela was, uh, was terminated. I think there's more shoes to drop. Um, and again, we ought to, we, we, you need to go back to September and see that first shoe drop when there was the con, when there was the dispute on the board about compensation of uh, of their investment investors or investment advisors, um, and and sort of follow that through. But the PF, but the but the board has a responsibility. If if the board is changing policy with respect to draws and no longer takes the position that it's a hard and fast POMV. Um, 50 or POMB, whatever it is, hard and fast POMB draw uh, with rules around that and no excess draws. If the board's changing its position on that, the board uh, needs to make that clear through uh, through additional policies or else through additional actions, through additional resolutions, or else the next executive director is going to run into the same problem. The problem is the board has said to this point, there are ru- they, they want rules around POMB uh, they want it set. They don't want any excess draws. That's what the board resolutions say. And if the board is going to is is now taking a different position, the board needs to come out and and say that uh, in uh, in some form, uh, or else every executive director is going to be uh, is going to be crossways uh, with the board because you know the board's writing one thing and then saying another in internal meetings. Let's uh, quickly talk. Um, give me a tease here for number three. Your agreement with Dermot Cole. We got less than a minute. So a few years ago, a couple of years ago, three years ago, at Craig, Richard, at Craig Richards' uh, uh, push, uh, the board decided to invest some of its funds, $200 million of its funds, in the state of Alaska. 
historically, there had been a hard and fast rule that, that the board, that permanent fund uh, corporation funds were invested only outside the state of Alaska. They made a change to, uh, to invest uh, in the state of Alaska. And now there's some issues coming up with that program that Dermot's highlighted uh, that I think are important to understand. Uh, and frankly, I think are fundamental problems are, are exposing fundamental problems with the board's decisions to invest uh, in Alaska in the first place. Even a stopped clock is right twice a day. So we agree with Dermot Cole on something. Uh, give us give us your take on, on what he's talking about here, because this has always been one of the arguments. So the permanent fund should be used to help benefit Alaskans in a multiplicity of ways, not just in rate of returns on the overall market, but that they should be making some investments inside the state and helping from that aspect as well. Yeah, that's that's been the argument. And that was Craig's argument when uh, when he pushed for this two hundred million dollar pot. Uh, to be given to uh, uh, outside inv- or investment advisors to invest in uh, in Alaska projects, but here's the point. I mean, Governor Ham. This, this goes all the way back to Governor Hammond, and and his philosophy was: we have two organizations. We have the Permanent Fund Corporation that is that is focused on maximizing uh, uh, returns on Alaska's. Uh, uh, wealth on the wealth generated from oil that's been set into the permanent fund and the permanent fund corporation is supposed to maximize that. And then we have ADA, the Alaska, Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority, uh, that will invest in internal Alaska projects and is focused on developing Alaska infrastructure and in developing Alaska uh, uh, businesses. And, and Hammond's view was there was a strict wall between the two that you didn't want the permanent fund corporation investing in Alaska because then you would be exposed to political forces that would say, oh, invest in this project as opposed to that project or as opposed as opposed to that project. And the whole process would become would uh, become political. And I and I think that's a very good rule to have. I mean, we've got ADA is doing whatever ADA is doing. Recently, they bid on uh, on leases in Anwar and they're all caught up in NAFTA uh, issue. They've invested in uh, the road to Ambler. Uh, the Ambler Mining Road, uh, and uh, and that's caught up in a bunch of issues. They've previously invested in other things that that have been uh, internal Alaska investments, and 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 that's okay. I mean, that's what they're that's what they're there to do. But the permanent fund uh, shouldn't, in my opinion, shouldn't be crossing over uh, and uh, and essentially doubling up uh, on what uh, on what Ada is supposed to do. What Dermot's focused on now is. Um, this 200 million has started to be invested. It's it, 100 million is set in one investment advisor, 100 million in another investment inv- advisor, and they've started to be invested in projects. A couple of the recipients of those investments, Peter Pan Seafoods being one, um, have disclosed as part of their marketing uh, to their investors, have disclosed that uh, permanent fund corporation funds have been invested in, in their projects. Um, and and they think it's a they they think that helps with their uh, investment marketing because other others will see that if the permanent fund corporation thinks that this is a good investment then they'll invest private funds to go along with it. But not all of the money has been has been disclosed, uh, and it's been disclosed by the people who receive the investments as opposed to being disclosed by the permanent fund corporation. What Dermot's concerned about is that such a, sets up an. A, a, if you don't have to disclose who's getting those funds, it sets up a, a, a situation where the corruption that, that Governor Hammond was concerned about can flourish because you can have these, these, these behind the scenes secret investments uh, that are going on with permanent fund corporation funds in state that can be politically directed or can be you know, business maneuvered. Um, and and if, if they're not disclosed, then people can't analyze whether those were appropriate investments or not, or whether they were tinged with political influence. And, and I agree with Dermot that, that, that if we're going to have this in-state program, we ought to have disclosure around it to at least mitigate the concerns that Hammond had with going down this road in the first place. But frankly, I would go back to first, to first principles and say, let's not do this at all. The Permanent Fund Corporation shouldn't be involved in internal Alaska uh, investments at all. If somebody has a project that they think is good for Alaska, take it to ADA uh, and let ADA evaluate it and let ADA invest in it if, um, if, if they determine that it, that, it, that it helps Alaska. But let's not get the permanent fund corporation messing around in in-state investments uh, and start, uh, start creating the potential for 
political influence and for undue business influence and undue donor influence uh, to start to start moving uh, start moving these dollars uh, uh, to 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 support private ventures that uh, that maybe don't produce the returns they should. Politics. It's the bane of our existence. It seems like you can't get away from it. It's everywhere. It's in everything. And uh, it's been killing us for 2000 plus years. So anyway, what are we going to do? Um, all right, Brad uh, Keith Lee, uh, Alaska's for sustainable budgets. As always, Brad, it's good to talk with you. Thanks for coming on board. Have safe travels. And uh, we will talk with you, I guess, next week about something. I don't know what, Brad, but I'm going to put on your thinking cap, my friend. Let's uh, <laughs> let's start talking about uh, favorite Christmas memories or musics or I can't play the musics, but we can talk about it. So uh, whatever I know that you're a, you're a huge, uh, huge uh, music aficionado. We can we can do that or uh, we can talk about that. So come on down. Well, t- t- top top three Christmas memories. Yes, yeah, there you like go. That. Top three Christmas right. memories. There you go. All right. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, our guest today here on the program. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.